Welcome to the second day of the Youth Connect Africa Summit, and we are here to discuss, to have a conversation on the urgency of sexual and reproductive health and rights, mental health, and economic empowerment. My name is Lauren Wamaitha. I am from Kenya, a global health advocate, and I'm here representing UNFPA Kenya Youth Advisory Panel. And uh, to start the panel, to start this conversation, I would like to, to just welcome and call on stage our powerful panelists that we have for you who have extensive experience in the conversation we are about to have today. So kindly put your hands together as I mention their names and as they walk towards the floor. A big loud of applause. And so our first panelist is the Minister of Information, Youth, Culture and Sports for Zanzibar, Honorable Tabia Maulid Muita. Our second panelist is Dr. Christelle Giraneza, an eye accelerator innovator of the Urukundo Initiative on Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights. She's followed by Honorable Emma Kantema Gaumas, the Deputy Minister of Sport, Youth, and National Service Namibia. And I'm so delighted to see all of you here, eager to engage and share with us on the nexus between sexual and reproductive health rights and mental health and economic empowerment. The urgency of these three issues in this decade of action cannot be ignored. And so we are very happy to have you here with us as we try to find ways we can be able to ensure that adolescents and the young persons in this continent of Africa are not left behind when it comes to health. Thank you. And so before we dive into the conversation, I would just like to give each and every one of us a context of what the situation is on sexual and reproductive health rights, mental health, and economic empowerment. And so nearly 37 million adolescents live with a mental disorder in Africa. And according to the World Bank data in 2019, Lesotho, South Africa, Eswatini, Botswana, and Zimbabwe are among countries with the highest suicide rates in the world, ranging from 14.1 per 100,000 in Zimbabwe to 72.4 per 100,000 in Lesotho the highest suicide rates in the world. And these are not just numbers and statistics. These are human beings. They are the present and the future of Africa. In addition, there is an emerging body of research exploring the intersection between mental health and sexual and reproductive health and rights in both development and humanitarian settings. The evidence shows that poor mental health outcomes, poor mental health can be a driver of negative sexual and reproductive health rights outcomes, and an inability to fully realize one's sexual and reproductive health rights can in turn result in negative mental health outcomes. And so, these numbers, especially these issues, especially affect the adolescents and young people. For example, in the context of HIV, in the context of HIV, depression, anxiety, stress, and HIV associated neurocognitive psychosocial impairments, they remain 
a significant burden that is further aggravating the well-being of this special population, which is actually the majority of the population in Africa. Moreover, it is also documented that pregnant adolescents in sub-Saharan Africa are two to nine times more likely to develop perinatal depression. I think we can all see how serious sexual and reproductive health rights, mental health, and economic empowerment are. And last but not least, half of all mental health disorders in adulthood start by age 14, but unfortunately, most cases are undetected and untreated. And therefore, this panel we have here today will be discussing that intersection between health and economic matters. And it, as it has been echoed here today, that health, good health means translate to improved wealth of the African continent. And so we are going to discuss on the impact of sexual and reproductive health rights and mental health and, on, and, on, and why we need to empower the young people economically and invest in the health of young people to allow us to achieve the Africa we, wo the Africa we want in this decade of action. Thank you. Thank you very much to our speakers. And so I'm going to start with uh, Honorable Minister Tabia Maulid. Thank you for joining us here today. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. I'm thank glad you so you're fine. And we are very interested to hear from you on what is in place in Zanzibar to ensure that young people access sexual and reproductive health rights services to avoid the pandemic of teenage pregnancies. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. Thank you, all participants, First Lady of the United Republic of Rwanda, uh, senior government officials, representatives of, uh, from UN, all organizers and sponsors, all youth representatives, and all ministers who represent youth in different African countries, good afternoon. Nawasalimu kwa jamuhuri ya mungano wa Tanzania, kazi iendele. Thank you. It is clear that to all of us, there is a direct link between sexual reproductive health and also mental health. And I'm sure most of us here will agree with me that young people in the continent are facing many challenges, in, including child marriage, teenage pregnancies, HIV and STI infections, gender-based violence, domestic violence, and other issues that lead to the young generation to face psychological problems. But as you said, let me go direct to your question, to what extent Zanzibar or Tanzania are trying their best to acknowledge, first of all, that there is a need for the young people to have sexual reproductive health and also the importance of young people to be educated in most areas where they can be able to stand by themselves, to defend themselves, and to make sure that by using different uh, youth agencies and development partners, those young people can be able to create their chances to employ themselves and not depending on the employment of the government so that they can be mentally active and finally being economic well. In Zanzibar, first of all, we are having a structure of three areas so that we make sure young people
can get the social reproductive health education. And first of all, it is starting in family, I mean family stage. Those family members are required to provide awareness at home, which means family members to sit down with their children, with their children, and give them the education on how to prevent themselves against the changing, or I mean global changing, social changing, cultural changes, and so many things that surround that young generation. But also, uh, second stage, in our country, we involve those cultural uh, sectors, like for example, spiritually, some uh, elders from the different uh, community uh, in Zanzibar, so that they can provide the curriculum and the sessions for young people to educate them about the importance of uh, sexual reproductive health, spiritually and culturally. And uh, the third stage is in the government itself, where uh, we have ministries, like my ministry, we have tried our best, first of all, to improve uh, youth policy, where they, those young people get the opportunity to contribute on what to be done so that social reproductive health can be taught in many sectors. Like nowadays, from 10 years, we start in upper primary school, secondary school, to teach all students about the importance of sexual reproductive health, about how to prevent themselves from early pregnancies and other uh, uh, calamities like HIV and some uh, any, I mean, and other things. So in Zanzibar, I can say, also we have a youth national council where young people can have the opportunity to sit down and express the ideas to the government on what to be done so that they can be prevented with their nation. So thank you very much for, for now, let me uh, give you that uh, explanation, but without forgetting, let me take this opportunity to thank and appreciate and recognize high contribution from our development partners, UNFPA, UNDP, UNICEF are helping us a lot in our government so that we can proceed with helping those young people in sexual reproductive health. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister Tabia Maulid. Indeed, there is hope. There is hope for the young people, for the adolescents in, in Zanzibar, in Tanzania, and in Africa and beyond. And so, hi, Dr. Christel. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing well. <laughs> An important strategy when working for young people is to do so with young people themselves. Can you share with us any ideas on how to facilitate young people's access to sexual and reproductive health rights as an innovator? Uh, thank you so much, Sister Lolan. So uh, I want to first start by appreciating and also being sincerely grateful. It's such an honor for me to stand here and be part of this panel discussion. As a young person, as a young lady, and also as a young sexual and productive health activist and advocate. And I also want to take this opportunity to uh, give my reconsideration and also be thankful for the First Lady of the Republic of Rwanda, Jeanette Kagame. She is one of my biggest role models, and I truly admire her. And it's because of how she believes in young people, and especially girls. And through Imbuto Foundation as the chairperson, together with Imbuto Foundation partners, they always find ways to empower girls and to empower young people, and believe that we have skills and potential. So I'm grateful and thankful as well. So, um, 
Responding to you, Sister Lolan, so one of the ideas is actually starting with us, young people. So as a fresh graduate in medical school, I can really testimony about that. And then one of the ways is actually investing in broader range of innovations and technology. At Urukundo Initiative, following UNFPA recommendation, that sexuality education can be provided through games and role plays, we came up with Urukundo Life Skill Board Game, which was a game uh, that we created throughout uh, Innovation Accelerator Program brought by Imboto Foundation, and that's where we started. And the young people in the room, I'm telling you, that was the first door which opened for us. And our game became an award-winning game. It was user-tested, and with the help and the support of the government, it got validated. It got at doorsteps of many families and schools, and it helps to create that bond between parents and children, and also improve parents and children communication on big matters of sexual reproductive health and mental health. And trust me, those issues are like myths and taboos. And not only in Rwanda, but also in the African continent. And through that innovation, we're able to see that young people have innovations and they have skills and potentials to deliver. All they have to be given to is an opportunity to express themselves and explore those potentials. And through different many programs, like the Innovation Accelerator Program, young people in Rwanda are given that opportunity. And it's seen that in schools, as Honorable said, Comprehensive sexuality education is there, but I welcome young people in the room to think about innovations and educative tools that can be used because they open up a platform to interact on such matters. And I would also like to take this opportunity to thank, to thank UNFPA Rwanda, Koika Rwanda, and the Ministry of Youth, Sport, and Culture of Rwanda because they supported different programs, which are also brought by Mbuto Foundation, in order for young people like me to stand here and testimony how preventive health is as far much important as curative health. And I'm telling you out of experience, I'm a fresh graduate medical doctor, and I'm telling you investments are required in all fields. Thank you. Thank you very much, Crystal. Indeed, we cannot progress, we cannot accelerate the, we cannot accelerate the sustainable development goals, and especially sexual and reproductive health rights without innovation. To um, Honorable Emma Kantema, we are honored to have you here today. And uh, we, are hon we are honored to have you here today and sh for you to share the work that the government of Namibia is focusing on to ensure that young people are not only empowered economically, but also healthily. Would you please give us a few examples of what is in place in Namibia for that to happen, especially now that Namibia has started the Youth Connect Africa Namibia chapter? Thank you very much for the opportunity. I bring you greetings from Namibia, the land of the brave. I'm pleased and excited to be here and uh, listening to Her Excellency uh, Ms. Janet Kagame speaking about what the uh, Imbuto Foundation is doing. As a leader in the youth sector, I was filled with hope knowing that, as uh, Ms. Kagame has mentioned, no problem is left unattended. And I think she really deserves a round of applause. I would like to preamble my um, input in terms of what we are doing in Namibia by saying that sexual reproductive health and economic issues are not mutually exclusive. And I'm very glad that Youth Connect Africa 
has identified sexual reproductive health as one of the area to focus on. In Namibia, we have elevated the issues of sexual reproductive health as it's permitting through at a policy level, program level, and is also featuring prominently in our partnership um, activities, especially in terms of activities that we are being supported with by UNFPA, including other civic um, society. The national youth policy of which our president, His Excellency Dr. Hage Gengob, spoke yesterday during the official opening has a pillar that speaks and focus specifically to youth and health. Now, in terms of this pillar, we have identified strategies how to achieve the objective, that of providing sexual reproductive health. And so one of the issues that we identified to tackle, which is a, a problem, is the accessibility part. And in terms of how we ensure that we provide this very important service to the youth, as a ministry that's entrusted to empower the youth, in Namibia we have what we call adolescent and youth-friendly clinics. These clinics are spread over the country. We have around six of the clinics that then offers and serves as a safe space for the youth to access sexual reproductive information, including services. It's very key to mention that this uh, service that we render also focuses on out-of-school youth because we do know that, it, especially for the youth who are in school, there's comprehensive sexuality education that's being provided. So towards this end, as a ministry, we have also developed a comprehensive sexuality education manual that speaks to out-of-school youth. In terms of ensuring that the youth or adolescents, especially the girls, remain in school, the Ministry of Education, Arts and Culture have developed a pregnancy policy that falls under education for all. Because as we are linking the health and economic opportunities, it's very important that we ensure that our girls remain in school because it then increases their chances to be economically active and to be productive citizens. In addition to the youth-friendly clinics that we offer, at the program level, we have a program that we collaborate with, with the UNFPA, Safeguarding Young People. Again, this is an opportunity for us to ensure that we reach out to the young ones to provide the service, especially where we do not have the youth-friendly clinics, we then um, conduct the outreach mobile clinics together with our condomized um, um, uh, activity. And uh, to end also, I would like to mention that we collaborate with the Office of the First Lady uh, under her program, the Be Free, and I'm happy to note that uh, Her Excellency Ms. Kagame joined us, I think that was in 2020. She joined one of our sessions. These are um, sessions that we have for the youth at a non-judgmental platform. Because we often hear that, you know, adults are not speaking to the youth about it, and there's also that need to destigmatize sexual reproductive health education. And lastly, I would like to mention that we've also um, gone a step ahead to ensure that sexual reproductive health involve community. Because what we see, it's good and well, we can provide this information, we can um, provide the service, but when the youth go back in their community, the aunties right there, the uncles, will tell them, no, 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 there's no need for birth control, there's no need for protection in terms of preventing HIV AIDS and other STI spread, so we really need to also address the community involvement part. And thank you very much. And as Namibia, we continuously seek for ways to ensure that we empower the youth, not only economically, but holistically, because we believe that Africa relies on the youth of today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed, policies, programs, and partnerships are the way to go as we continue addressing sexual and reproductive health rights, mental health, and economic empowerment. 
and to Dr. Jean Pierre. Let's, ref let's, re let's reflect on the young people's uh, mental health. What is the current situation? And as we seek to promote mental well being in young people, in your view, how can integrating mental health in sexual and reproductive health rights programs improve the health outcomes for the young people. Thank you. Mental health. Mental health. What does come to your mind when you hear that word? Mental health. So the integration of the two, first consider this. What affects the brain affects the body. What affects mental health affects sexual and reproductive health. What affects social, I mean sexual and reproductive health affects mental health. And I appreciate how speakers have brought those together and are starting to think, I mean it is not starting, there has been a journey towards that, because there has been for too long a dualistic approach of thinking about mental health separated from physical health. Thinking about mental health separated from sexual and reproductive health. And I think one of the reasons is probably that we have not been able to understand mental health as it is. Our understanding of mental health is is related much with the stigma associated with it rather than what it is in reality. And I want to appreciate what has been done so far. Last time I was uh, also honored to speak at uh, Chogam and uh, the topic for the day was rethinking mental health. And uh, allow me uh, to quote uh, the words that um, were shared in that space. Uh, it's been many years since I have uh, been a part of the mental health work, and I can feel the hope that I have I never had before uh, when trying to advocate for mental health. When I said I want to quote and thank Her Excellency Mrs. Janet Kagame on her remarks on that day, on June 22nd, 2022. Part of what she said was, we are gathering under the reality that as we speak, According to WHO, one-eighth of the people we know, one-eighth of the people we love, is affected by mental health problems. Now, as I'm going to repeat this text, this quote, I invite you to think of that one, when I say one, think about someone here in the room. Sometimes we think about mental health and uh, we don't think about us, about ourselves. We think about hospitals and we think about uh, some people that look in a certain way. But when, again, I invite you, when I read these, those, that one, when I say one, think about yourself. Actually, not someone else. Everyone here experiences stress. The only time you do not experience stress is after we say goodbye, when you are no longer with us, 
when I'm no longer with you is when I will be free from stress. But I'm not talking about mental health disorders then. Not everyone has a mental health disorder. But we experience mental health disorders after a long accumulation of stress. It doesn't come overnight. Back to the quote. We are gathering under the reality that as we speak, according to the WHO, one, one, you, myself. It's about us. One. Let me repeat. We are gathering under the reality that as we speak, according to WHO, one eighth of the people we know, one eighth of the people we love. So if we have one out of a number of people around you, one out of the people you know, one out of the people in your family, in your classroom, your co-workers, people in the room on the same row. When we talk about mental health, we are talking about us. If I can ask, or something I've been uh, observing in a clinical practice. When it comes to entrepreneurship, what does it require? Entrepreneurs, tell someone else next to you one word of what it requires to be a good entrepreneur. All right. Ideas. Someone else? All right. All of those and more, more, more things that the people here are thinking. Can you have the ideas, the ideas without mental health? How does that look like? I want to appreciate, as I uh, uh, finish the quote by Her Excellency uh, Janet Kagame, I appreciate the work that has been done in this holistic approach of looking about mental health, not just as this is something that is here on the top, and this the rest of the body as if it is the transportation of the head. It is not true. That's why when we are thinking about mental health and those initiatives I've been observing uh, uh, with uh, Imbuto Foundation and the others, when they think, when you want to think about uh, businesses, entrepreneurship, it has to be with mental health. When you think about health, sexual and reproductive health, it's connected to mental health. But then what is the mental health? A few things, a part of it, we don't know yet what the really mental health is, and I think we need to appreciate that. And the reason we know, part of it, is that mental health is what is helping us think. Why did you come here? Why did you come here? Mental health is what supports us to think. Thinking is the mental health. Imagine yourself not being able to think. Those creative ideas you have because you have a good mental health. Mental health is about feeling. Those feelings you have, the joy, the romantic relationship and how you express them, it's about mental health. If you didn't know, how it contributes, then you will know when you see someone in a relationship and then the mental health isn't working well or they are stressed out, something is suffer. Mental health is how we react. The gesture I'm using, the choices you made, the clothes, these colors, the words I'm choosing to use and not the other one. That is the mental health. 
So when we stigmatize mental health, we stigmatize ourselves. We stigmatize our abilities. We stigmatize our potentials. And now thinking about connecting to sexual and reproductive health, what is it? Part of it, I'm not an expert on it uh, compared to many others who, especially those who have been victims related to sexual and reproductive health. I believe that those with experiential knowledge are, uh, are the experts of those experiences when it comes to that topic. But let me say a little thing. Sexual and reproductive health being about the freedom and the right to choose or to decide who you have sex with, how to avoid sexually transmitted diseases, how to avoid unintended pregnancies. So when then we get to get drunk, think about the definition of mental health. It's about how we think, we feel, we react, we make decisions, and I'm just thinking, talking about the thinking. The rest, there's also other factors. So when the mental health thinking, the feelings, the reactions, and decision-making is impaired, when you have a heightened stress, when you have a high level of stress, your capacity to judge your capacity to make good decisions is impaired. The sexual violence, or maybe wanting, engaging in an unprotected sex, or even that feelings, talking about one of those issues we see is uh, people feeling like they have lost any, everything and they have nothing to lose, so it's okay to have that unprotected sex. We see that in the clinical settings and in the outreach. So when it comes then to coping and working with these depressions, which we are seeing as the numbers have been uh, shared, it's alarming on our continent. When it comes to depression, more than 100 million that was shared. And the women being more vulnerable to the depression, now you can see the interconnection. More than 66 million, among the 100 million in Africa, 66, 66 million are women and in sub-Saharan Africa. So you can also connect to that. Subsistence abuse, subsistence use in Africa is also a big problem. And when you bring it together with uh, Depression, something, one is causing another and the other is making the other worse. And we are seeing alarming statistics like recent numbers of 42%, 42% of youth. In Sub-Saharan Africa, a recent study showed that uh, youth are engaging, those numbers, among those who were surveyed, 42 were using drugs, uh, any types of drugs or uh, 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 that abuse those uh, um, others that's alcohol. When I say drugs also, allow me to say alcohol and other drugs because it can be toxic itself. So I, as I uh, conclude this conversation, if you are here, the safe knowledge is important for you to engage in a process of healing, knowing what you want, and the, allowing yourself to engage in a therapeutic process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jean-Pierre. And last but not least, to Charles, all the way from Uganda. You are the chairperson of the National Youth Network called Afrian in Uganda. Please tell us why investing in young people's health is important also for economic growth in our countries and overall in our beautiful continent in just a few minutes. Um, thank you so much, moderator. I think the moderator is doing a good job. Can we clap for her and she's still young? 
I, and thank you so much for the opportunity. I want to appreciate uh, UN, uh, UNFPA Uganda for sponsoring my uh, trip to this place. Rwanda is so, so beautiful, and I'm really, really, really comfortable here. Thank you so much for hosting us, Rwanda. I'm still as well happy that the majority of this congregation are young people, and whatever I'm going to be speaking is, is something to inspire you young people to, to be a voice and demand for your rights. Are you hearing me? You should demand for what belongs to you. So about 60% of the Africa's population are young people below the age of 25. If we want to, if we are speaking about investing in young people, we are actually literally talking about investing in us because we are the majority. The country I come from, Uganda, over 75% of the population is below the age of 30. That shows you how important we are because we are the majority. And I'll tell you that if we invest in young people, we are not just investing in them, but we are also investing in the future. The young people are here for a longer time compared to the older generation. The skills we give them, they are going to live with them for a long time. Young people have a lot to lose as opposed to, to the older generation. So there is a lot that we should do, and uh, it is very important that we set key priorities around health. I want to share with you uh, just some statistics, uh, and this is very undesirable. And I'll use a case study of Uganda because I think I know Uganda better, but it's just a representation of so many other countries in Africa. Out of when you are working in Uganda, if you pass for young children, young girls below the age of 19, if you pass four of them, one of them is either pregnant or she has a child. What does that mean? It means that 25% of that age bracket, they are young mothers or they are, having, they are pregnant. So, there was a study that was done by UNFPA Uganda, and it says that if the current teenage pregnancy rate is reduced from 25% to just 10%, actually even 10% is still big. It's still big. But if it's reduced to that, about half of the health care expenditure for teenage mothers will be saved. Half, half of the health care expenditure for teenage mothers will be saved equivalent to 169 million US dollars. Annually, more than 181 million, million US dollars will be spent by government of Uganda on health care for the teen mothers and the education of their children every year. That's how much uh, uh, Uganda can, will be spending. 181 million US dollars. So what does that tell us? It tells us there is a lot we should do to ensure that these girls, and actually also boys, because you know it's a girl doesn't get pregnant by herself. It's either me or, or him who will do it, who will impregnate her. So it's important for us to invest in them, not just actually services, but also information. With information, these girls and boys are able to make informed decisions. I have some bit of background in medical. And most of the time when these girls uh, come to us, they will, they actually, sometimes they don't know what to do. They don't, they don't have information about emergence contraception. And as I think some of them are here. She'll, get pre she'll have sex because sometimes we don't have control over that because those, these are feelings and they're natural, you know? But how do we manage them? Yes, yeah, so if you laugh, please, please go on. Like, you can laugh. So the thing is that we may not be able to control our feelings, but how can we control the way we, we have sex, you know? So do we have information about contraception? How many of us in government are 
You know, the, in April 2001, the AU Commission and all the, uh, the governments in, under AU, they passed a resolution and they said about 15% of every country's budget should go towards health. In Uganda, it has never crossed up to 10. I don't know about here. Maybe Honorable Mbabazi can tell us. If it was a ministry kind of health uh, 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 event, I would be asking every minister to tell us what the percentage is in their country. But for us, it's been, I think, about between 6 and 8 percent. And that was a resolution that was passed about how many years? About 20 years. So with the figures I've just shown you, you can see how much we can actually spend if we invest in the health of young people, not just services, but also information, policies that talk about health. Uh, do we have friendly policies for schools? Like, do we have teachers or uh, people that speak to young people about health? Do they know what to do? You know, there are so many young people who are bored, and it's not because actually they want to abort, but they are just circumstances. As he was saying, mental health. Most of you ladies, you will tell us that even when you're just in your period, you are not mentally fine, you know? You're moody. Now, some of us who are, you know, in my capacity, at least I've had uh, opportunities to be with lovers, but when they are in that period, they will tell you, you know what, I'm not in the mood. Why? Because they are not in the mood. You get it. So it's, it's, it's very important for us to invest in young people with information, but also the services. I want to mention something. There's something very, uh, very bad about our healthcare system. And we have, sometimes we have facilities, and they are good. But when you walk in these facilities, there are no services. Human resource for health. We don't, the ratio is, is alarming. We don't have healthcare workers, and the population is, is quite big. So for me, I think I can uh, briefly just share that, but there is a lot to do, and we really, really need to put our monies into the healthcare system and ensure that the girls and boys have information so that they can make decisions, informed decisions. If they want to get pregnant, let them get pregnant to when they are, well, well informed than just it being an accident. We are tired of having unwanted pregnancies and unintended pregnancies. Thank you so much. Wow, wow. Thank you very much to our panelists for sharing and contributing to this conversation. Africa it appreciates whatever actions you're doing in your respective communities. Collective action will indeed bring the change and enable us to get to the Africa that we want.